Let's take our Bibles and turn to the end of John's Gospel, chapter 21. Consider a passage that has meant a great deal to me since uh, undergraduate days in college. Dr. Gamble mentioned last week how preaching his autobiography, and that's, been, that's especially true as I think about this passage and how the Lord has used it in my own life. Chapter 21, John chapter 21, and let me read that last section there where Jesus is engaging Peter and commissioning him and uh, telling him about his future ministry. And we'll concentrate, we're going to concentrate on verses 18 through about 23, but let me read just that whole last section, 15 through uh, the end of the chapter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we are your sheep. We need shepherding. These are your words. Give us ears to hear them now. Show us the word of life himself, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Every time I'm here, I think about just how how much of an opportunity seminary is. You know, as Jerry was praying, Dr. Um, Dr. O'Neill was praying about how the nations have uh, assembled here. This is a mini UN. <laughs> so the blessed relationships you have. And of course, it is a time where you have an opportunity to become very, very deeply acquainted with the faith that was once delivered to the saints. But in all that earnest attention that is given to taking in the content of faith, all the learning of ways to contend for the faith, what seminary must never, ever become is a place and a time where you lose sight of the fundamental call of faith. And that call, repeated various different ways over and over again in the New Testament, is summed up in the two words of Jesus in verse 19. Follow me. And I want to just take a few minutes together, reflect a little on that. Reflect particularly on 
this call of faith and a little of what that means for us. So if you like folks to hang on, just three considerations. It means we follow Christ in cruciformity. Big theological word, but we're in seminary. I'll explain it. In cruciformity, without comparing, and with confident consolation. Okay, so in cruciformity, without comparing, but with confident consolation. In cruciformity. Bonhoeffer famously said in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And for Bonhoeffer, for Peter, according to verse 19, it says, by what kind of death? And many others throughout the history of the church, up through today, right now, that call is literal martyrdom. When John, you know, when Calvin started his uh, Geneva Seminary in 1559, uh, it became, it eventually became known as Calvin School of Death. Because um, at least 88 graduates, that's how many were listed, but probably uh, many more than that. At least 88, though, who were sent out to plant Protestant churches back in France were martyred. So it was like you graduated and you were going to be martyred. It was a certificate of death because Catholic France was not friendly to Protestants during that time. And this is to say nothing to the missionaries he sent to South America who were eaten. <laughs> but this call to die, this call to cruciformity, isn't just for those who go on to actually be martyred. The whole design our discipleship is cross-shaped. It's marked by cruciformity. We know the words of Jesus. If anyone would come after me, what? Let him deny himself and take up his cross, not just once, daily, and follow me. Following Jesus is synonymous with a life of dying, of cruciformity. So, of course, the call to cruciformity as we follow Christ speaks to more than just the end of a disciple's life, but the whole of life, day in and day out. And as disciples of Christ, we follow him, as Paul says, in conformity to his death, even as we know and experience the power of his resurrection. As ones united to Jesus by faith, we live and we experience the sentence of death sometimes literal, most of the time by way of suffering of various and sundry sorts. We experience the sense of death in ourselves, but that is so that we might not trust in ourselves, but in him who raises the dead. So death isn't the end. An apostle just over and over, Paul is the apostle of death. <laughs> And resurrection. Over and over he reminds us, he reminded the Romans that what? They were baptized into Christ Jesus, which is to say they were buried with him by baptism into death and subsequently raised from spiritual death to what end? To walk in newness of life. There's death, there's resurrection. So brothers and sisters, our whole Life in Christ is marked by cruciform death and resurrection life. So we follow Christ as ones who die daily and who live as ones marked by resurrection life. It takes both of those, of course. <laughs> if you only have resurrection, you become a naive triumphalist. 
It's like reading too much Bart. You know, there's no negativity. It's all positive. It all ends, and, right, if you only have resurrection. But if you only have cross, that kind of leads to a kind of Nietzschean nihilism that doesn't see how God brings people from the dead. <laughs> so we live out this reality of death, of dying, cruciformity, but it's never, ever to be detached from resurrection. Now, of course, this dying, as has been implied already, takes many different forms and shape, shapes in our lives as disciples, as ones who follow Christ. It includes dying to self-willed desires and plans to personal autonomy, being our own person. Look what Jesus told Peter in verse 18. He says, you will be carried where you do not want to go. Later in life, you'll be led, taken places that you don't want to go. So for Peter, for us, following may mean being led where you don't want to go into undesirable places. I, uh, I heard someone recounting a conversation he had with a, a PCA pastor in Alabama. And this pastor was, in the later part of his ministry, he had enjoyed decades of ministerial success. But he was, at that point, when he had this conversation, he was in a very dry, hard season. Uh, his marriage was struggling. He was in failing health. Uh, his ministry just wasn't as fruitful as it had been for the previous decades. So he was in a hard uh, place, not much demonstrable fruit. And what that pastor said in that conversation, he, he said he was learning that it's so hard to work for God when God turns ugly. And that's actually what it feels like when you're led where you don't want to go. Um, and you know, it's not just, just that you may be led where you don't want to go. You're often led with people you don't want to go with. <laughs> We're truthful. And we need to remember this when you find yourself in a hard ministerial situation or just any generally difficult place in life that you know God has been directing you into. Now, the thing to do in those situations is not to engage in navel-gazing self-pity, but to actually lift your eyes in faith and see the larger story of what God is actually up to in your difficulty. And what is that? He's actually getting glory to himself. Verse 19, Peter was led, right, where he didn't want to go in verse 18. But then we have this explanatory cause. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to what? Glorify God. So our gory, cross-bearing life of suffering is actually telling a story of God's glory. So don't be so self-centered and narcissistic about our pain and suffering and difficulties. It's not about us. <laughs> there's actually something bigger, better, more beautiful going on. And besides, God's glory is far more interesting than our self-pity stories. <laughs> this is just basic confession, uh, catechism question 101. What is our chief end? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And sometimes that means we're in these hard places. God is getting glory. It's telling a story. Your present difficulty, your future difficulties are telling this big, beautiful story and magnifying the God who has led and directed you there. Lafayette Church is glorifying God in its struggles and sufferings. God is getting glory in our difficult stories. So the call is to cruciformity. We follow Christ, we follow him in death. Secondly, though, this call to follow Christ is to be pursued with single-eyed focus without comparing. 
right? This is where it gets real real. <laughs> right? Look, Peter's particular response, and this is what has always hit me over the years in this passage, Peter's response to the particular call in his life to die was what? Was to consider what was in store for his close associate, John. Right? And, and we don't have any, there really is no ground in the text. There's no reason to believe that Peter's question was ill-motivated. Really don't. I mean, he was good friends with John. They were the inner sanctum, as it were. No reason to believe that it was an ill-motivated question. But nevertheless, Jesus' response to that inquiry was emphatic. Verse 22, what is that to you, Peter? You, that's emphasis in the Greek, you follow me. That's theological for Peter. It's none of your business. The call to discipleship demands a single-eyed focus that doesn't veer off into comparing providential dealings in the lives of others. Isn't the folly of that readily apparent to you? I mean, one, to actually inquire into what God is specifically up to, what Christ is doing in a particular life of another person, is to occupy ourselves with matters that are beyond us. We don't get to inquire into the secret ways of God with other people. That's not our domain. It's above our pay grade. So it's folly on that account, right? I mean, I know many parents who are desperate to try to understand what God is up to in the lives of their children, who are living their lives and leading their lives in ways that they don't understand and don't want, and that bring heartbreak. But it isn't even the obligation of parents to trust. And pray. But also, you know, comparing... What it does is so easily leads to envy and jealousy. There's a, a ministerial colleague of mine. We're the same age. Uh, we graduated undergrad together. Uh, even competed in similar things in undergrad. We've journeyed since graduation. We've journeyed a similar denominational path after college and into grad school or seminary. However, he has now gone on to author numerous books, <laughs> right? to have distinguished positions in denominational agencies, to pastor large, historic, influential churches. He's pastoring one now. And I'm pretty sure he's going to be moderator of our denomination in the not-too-distant future. I keep waiting for his name to come up in the election, right? And I, I have genuinely rejoiced in God's kindness and providential de- leading and dealing in my friend's life. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there have been faint echoes in the recesses of my mind <laughs> where the question has been raised, why him and not me? I've been Peter. Peter. Okay, me, but why am not me, right? If you let that kind of thing go on, in in all reality, it can actually lead to you questioning the very wisdom of God in your life. Questioning his dealings with you particularly, if you allow that train of thought to run, run alone. Especially when you perceive that your path of discipleship the way in which you have been called to follow Christ is demonstrably harder (laughs) than the others. Questions can arise. You know, at worst, comparing led to disaster in the first family. Cain's murderous hatred for his righteous brother Abel. Right, he compared and he killed. And hopefully, that degree of depravity won't break out in any of us. But for sure, 
know that there are many lesser degrees of this same sin-tainted dynamic of comparing. I know lots of insecure, jealous ministers who wonder why their congregations aren't doing as well as ones pastored by their friends. That's just a reality of depravity. And even the prosperity of other ministers, you may find yourself in this situation at some point, if not today. The prosperity of other ministers may even sting them a bit, if we're honest. Gore Vidal once insightfully said, every time a friend of mine succeeds, a little piece of me dies. That's not the kind of cruciformity we're after. <laughs> Yet still, in spite of whatever is going on in others' lives, whatever blessedness they may seem to enjoy, the call and command to Peter, and by extension to us, is still, what is that to you? You follow me. Now, with this command and call, it, it doesn't come to us as just this bare directive this command that just comes to us without any context. It's actually couched in a consoling confidence. We follow Christ with this consoling confidence. In answering Peter's question, you know, what about him? Jesus actually appeals to his authority as commander of heaven and earth. Implicitly, though. What does he say in verse 22? He says, if it is my will. And then it's summed up again what he said in verse 23. If it is my will. Here's the consolation. In following Christ, we aren't merely striving to keep a command. We are being led and guided by the will of a sovereign Lord and loving shepherd who, as the confession reminds us, directing all creatures by his most wise and holy providence. And he is leading us into good pastures eternally. That's the consoling confidence. If it be my will. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, help us to follow you where you lead. Give us the faith to believe in your goodness in that leading, even when it's difficult. Deepen these truths into our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.